Origin just wants to do X and this is Russia is getting closer to Pokrovsk. Russian invasion of Ukraine by our kings in general. It's been a while since I did a kings in general video. Uh, their series usually like is like stretching from like start to end type of way. I didn't know they made a latest one. Um, this is the latest one, right? Like with the what is happening right now. So Russia is. Uh, I'm guessing this is like southern Ukraine, right? Uh, Kharkiv and around that place. So like uh, everybody is like trying to do their strategy thing, right? Uh, Ukraine with Kursk while Russia is like I guess getting closer to Pokrovsk. This was seven days ago, so I don't know. Uh, updates doesn't come that fast, so I don't know what what's gonna happen after this. But yeah, this video is gonna be interesting. Let's do this one. Remember, if you like my next one, don't forget to subscribe so that way I know which type of videos to react to more. Uh, you know, I've been watching this, uh, you know, like recent conflict type of videos a lot from like other channels like Task and Purpose, Enforcer, and things like that. Now, Kings in general. So, if you haven't seen those reactions, check out the link in the description or in the end of the video end card. And let's begin. Ukraine's breakthrough in Kursk raised the mood among Ukrainians in August, but did not do much, if anything, to prevent the Russian offensive tempo in Donbass. The Ukrainian army has struggled so mightily in the Pokrovsk sector in August that there are rumblings about the potential collapse of the AFU front there. In this video on the war in Ukraine, we will discuss the Russian success in this sector, the situation on the Kursk front, and all other important updates from this war in the second half of August. This week, our YouTube members and patrons will continue watching our series on the North African campaign during World War II, as we cover Operation Crusader, during which Rommel faced the Allies once again. The support of our YouTube members and patrons allows us to continue releasing these free videos without worrying about unstable YouTube ad revenue and lets us be more choosy in terms of our sponsors. You can join their ranks via the links in the description and get access to two weekly exclusive videos, more than 150 right now including the series on the Pacific War, Fall of Sparta, First and Second Punic War, Russian Revolutions and the Civil War, Attack- Yeah, I don't know, why is King General not monetizing that video? They should do that because in the end of the day, YouTube's still gonna run ads. If you don't monetize, YouTube's gonna take 100% of your, re your revenue, your thing, right? Uh, so 250,000 views here. If you don't monetize, whatever ads that run, YouTube's gonna take all of it. So maybe it will not receive ad maybe it might get like demonetize the video limited or whatever right but maybe not so you know just like monetize why not italian reunification wars albigensian crusade history of prussia biography of sulla iberian reconquista the world war ii north african campaign the persian wars and much more thanks for your kind support let's start this update with perhaps the most consequential sector of the battlefield right now the pokrovsk sector as a reminder, Pokrovsk is a crucial logistics hub for the Ukrainian defense in Donbass. It is one of the two railway hubs under the AFU's control in Donbass right now. To put it in the simplest terms, supplies and equipment are brought via railways to logistical hubs and then transported to the front lines by vehicles via highways and roads. Kramatorsk is still quite far from the Russian army, so there is no immediate threat to the Ukrainian logistics in North Donbass. Pokrovsk is responsible for the Ukrainian logistics in South Donbass. Losing this city would not necessarily mean the collapse of all logistics in this area, but it is going to take longer to supply this front at the very least. And judging by the speed of the Russian advance in August, the Battle of Pokrovsk may start very soon. At this point, the Russian 15th, 30th, 137th and Vostok brigades, the 288th Artillery Brigade and the 90th Tank Division along with several other smaller units, are advancing on Pokrovsk from three axes. In the second half of August, the situation of the Ukrainian army on each of these axes hastily deteriorated. The Russian army captured Novotoretska, Novozhilena, Zavitna, Skuchna, Mezhova, Komishivka, Petitsha and Mikolaevka, among other villages. In the north, the Russian army advanced along the Kazenitoretz river to threaten Rodivka from the north, along with approaching from the south, capturing Krutiya, making advances in Krasnyar and attacking Rodivka directly. Here, the 151st Ukrainian Brigade looks outnumbered, being assaulted from several directions. In the south, the Russians forced a quick retreat of the 68th Jaeger Brigade and the 25th Air Assault Brigade, which withdrew under the threat of encirclement, losing several villages in the process. Now battles are going on in Selidove. Here too, the Russians are attacking from Mikhailivka and from the north of Selidove, 
and it looks doubtful that the undermanned AFU brigades will be capable of holding on for much longer. Pro-Ukrainian commentators had some hopes for the success of the defense against the central Russian axis, attacking Novorodivka, since this town had quite strong defensive positions, several strongholds, and a line of trenches. But the 47th Brigade has seemingly retreated from Novorodivka without a fight. In general, the aerial footage of recently captured towns and villages in the Pokrovsk sector. But if, if it's stronger defenses, why did they retreat like that? I'm guessing this like Kursk offensive is like draining resources from there. I guess there's a gamble going on right now between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, the Russia was like uh, already attacking this place really heavily, right? So uh, Ukraine took a gamble with Kursk. Maybe Russia diverts forces there. Maybe it's just another like thing they hold. So they can negotiate stronger or whatever, but it's gonna cost them here, obviously. ...shows that they have not been destroyed nearly as much as places like Bakhmut or Avdivka, which the Ukrainians defended for months. This indicates that the Russians did not have to use too much artillery or glide bombs to capture them. Indeed, the Ukrainian withdrawal was so fast and unexpected that the Russian military bloggers have even suspected an intricate tactic of the Ukrainian command to lure them in and catch them by surprise from the northern and southern flanks. That would be a dream scenario for Ukraine, however, the more realistic explanation is that the Ukrainian army's manpower shortage is worse than many had thought, leading to a collapse of the Ukrainian defenses in the Pokrovsk sector. The Ukrainian media outlet Telegraph reported, citing its sources in the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense, that the AFU reserves have experienced a 2.5-fold increase since the adoption of the mobilization bill in May, in comparison with the first quarter of 2024 so the army's manpower shortage should not be that bad. The Azov spokesman, Roman Ponomarenko, stated that the crisis in Donbass was caused by disorganization of the defense and tired and demoralized troops. He claims that the arrival of the mobilized is not helping the defense. On the contrary, it makes it more difficult, probably due to a lack of training and morale issues. Yeah, I think we all know what happened there. They basically pulled troops there to Kursk. I guess that's what he's going to say after this point. So this is what was happening before the Kursk offensive. Well, a lot of Russian commentators were like analyzing this thing. Oh, wait a minute. It's, you know, lack of, you know, like uh, training and like, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, demoralized and shit like that. They were guessing all these things, but they were pre probably pre preparing for Kursk and then Kursk offensive happened, right? Because... Not in their wild dreams, they would have even thought of like nightmares, they would have thought that that would happen. So that's interesting. Other commentators have blamed the poor coordination of rotation between units in the Pokrovsk sector for the recent setbacks. Ukraine still has several brigades in reserve here, and perhaps the deployment of more battle-hardened and trained units may change the situation. For now, the situation looks dire, as with the current rate of advance, the Russians may reach Pokrovsk in a matter of weeks, if not days. The Ukrainian command may decide to make a stand on the outskirts of Pokrovsk itself as the most realistic option of preventing the collapse of this sector. Elsewhere in Donbass, Russian progress has been more modest. In the Turetsk sector, the Russians have completed the capture of Zelizna and New York, along with making small advances inside Turetsk. In Chesivyar, they have reportedly finally managed to gain a foothold across the canal. It is not entirely clear if the Russian army now has a permanent presence beyond the canal, which is one of the critical defensive barriers of the Ukrainian army in this town. Still, if they do, this spells further problems for the AFU's hold over Chesivyar. The Russians have also captured Konstantinivka and advanced on Vodiana, which means that Ukraine's control over Vulodar is becoming tenuous due to supply issues. Around Vulodar, the Ukrainians have also fallen back from Pavlivka. In the Kupiansk sector, the Russians claimed to have occupied St. Kivka in August after almost a year of fighting for this village. Hold up there, one thing I'm noticing. I haven't seen any other channel talking about this, where like southern Ukraine is facing this kind of like defeats over and over again from Russia. Kings and General is the only one I've seen so far. And like other ones like mostly talk about Kursk. So Kursk offensive might have been uh, in a way a uh, positive light for Ukraine type of like propaganda type shit. Is it called propaganda? I don't know. Like trying to get good PR. Because American everybody was always thinking like, should we support Ukraine more? Like, are we even seeing progress? So Ukraine had to show American everybody like, yeah, we're still getting progress. We're still doing our thing. Give us more. And after the Kursk offensive, like they were, America pretty sure like passed more defense bills and things like that. So you Ukraine probably know the level of, uh, you know, like defeat they are facing in the South. And if that's the news, 
globally that's bad PR nobody's gonna help you so you have to do something that takes away news from there shows your thing in positive light so people can actually have it could be one of those things and if that's the case like that's awesome psychological warfare isn't it because it worked right people are seeing Kursk offensive people are seeing Ukraine in positive light and other countries are actually increasing their help meanwhile Russia has been scrambling to bring reinforcements to stabilize the Kursk front one of the goals of the Kursk offensive was to force the Russian command to redeploy units from Ukraine in order to weaken Russia's offensive potential, particularly in the Pokrovsk sector. However, even though some troops have been sent from Ukraine to stabilize the situation in the Kursk Blast, Russia has avoided weakening its Pokrovsk force too much. And it looks like, after the rapid advance of the Ukrainian forces in the early days of the offensive, the Russians have managed to stabilize this front. Initially, small Ukrainian units were capable of slicing through undermanned Russian defenses in the Kursk Oblast, making the front line extremely fluid. But in the second half of August, the situation has become more stable. The fighting is still going on in three main sectors. One is in and around Korinevo, particularly to the east of this town. The Ukrainian goal here is to reach the logistics hub of Rilsk. Another sector is the east of Sudja. That's big. This town is the biggest capture of the Ukrainian army so far in the Kursk Offensive and they've been trying to expand the area of control around it to the east and northeast along the R200 highway. The third sector of battles is along the 38K-024 highway, where the Ukrainians have advanced north to the vicinity of Kautchuk and Kromskibiki. The presumed ultimate goal of this axis is Ligov, lying on the E38 highway. The AFU Hold has achieved- there. Judging from the area they captured, isn't that like too ambitious of goal, like going all this distance? Like, like Kings and General said, like, you know, like, area has been stabilized because there's, like, re Russian defense is there. I, even the enforcer is not posting that many videos anymore. I mean, the live thing is doing it. So I just assume, like, okay, things are, like, slowing down now, right? Uh, because both sides are, like, holding out places. That would make sense. If that's the case, isn't there, like, too ambitious thing going all the way to Lagao, whatever that is, like, same way in the like, east and, not east, basically, in front. Basically, they're trying to go all the way there. Like, how are they going to do that? Maybe very slowly, maybe over time, right? But not the same way they capture all these places in like surprise attack. It's not gonna happen like that. Minor progress on all three axes in the second half of August, but at this point, they would need more men and firepower to achieve any meaningful breakthrough in the Kursk Blast, where the Russians may already have a manpower advantage. The area where the Ukrainian army is most likely to achieve success is south of the river Seim. This area is connected to the rest of the Kursk Blast via three bridges in the Glushkovo area. All three bridges have been destroyed by HIMARS and FPV drones. The Russians are trying to solve this problem by installing pontoon bridges, but we've seen several videos of the destruction of these pontoon bridges too. Sooner or later, the Russian grouping south of the Seam, which is estimated to have anywhere from several hundred to two to three thousand Russian soldiers, will face supply problems. They will either have to find a way to withdraw or face an uneven battle with better equipped AFU units. Yeah, that's the problem when it comes to Russia, right? Russia is so big and geography is so diverse. How are you going to know what to do when all the time? That's the problem, right? So just like, okay, river, there's one river cutting off the whole place. Let's just destroy the bridges. There you go, you cut off the supplies. Anytime somebody puts pontoon bridges, destroy that as well. We have like Amazon drones, cheap, can just instantly do it. Why not? So basically this whole place is going to be harder to like maintain and like supply. That is the problem if you are like too big of a place to defend. Like you would not, if you, if you focus on key places, you're going to ignore some places which can take advantage of like this. Geography can be advantage at the same time massive weakness. While the end goal of the Ukrainian Kursk offensive is still not entirely clear, we can deduce some things from the statements of Ukrainian leaders and the events on the ground. Zelensky has stated that the Kursk Offensive is part of a larger military political and military diplomatic operation. What else is he going to say? That likely means that by capturing some Russian land, Zelensky wants to ensure a stronger diplomatic position. <laughs> I mean, what else is he going to say? I don't know, we're winging it. Is that what he's going to say? Like, yeah, this is a short time, I don't know where this is going. Of course, he's going to explain, oh, this is like a bunch bigger plan. If it, probably it is, like then, I don't know, like maybe it's a bigger plan, like negotiating, like... Yeah, like everybody just basically suspect it's probably negotiation thing. Like, give me that, I'll give you back cost type of way. I don't know, long term thing. But even if it's not, he's not gonna say like, oh, is this short term? I don't know what we are. We are just winging it. They're not gonna say that. In future negotiations, 
It also means that Ukraine wants to destabilize the situation in Russia and damage Putin's reputation as a guarantor of stability and protector of Russia. We will soon see how successful Ukraine has been in achieving these targets. Zelensky also claimed that by launching the Kursk offensive, Ukraine prevented the Russian offensive on Sumy. There have been rumblings about Russia's intention to attack Sumy. Are you sure about that? Because if they attack from both Armenia, they're trying to take over this place. That's where they destroyed the bridges. That's the place, right? Pontoon bridges and things. Now you are only one place. But if they could have attacked from both sides, you could have cut off the whole area, right? Trapped them. Basically, every time you see World War II maps, like there was that, like history, that channel, it just shows like how Nazis and Germany were working, like trapping people, POWs, trapping people, POWs. Because once you trap somebody from both sides, they are basically screwed at that point. Those are POWs, basically. So if the Russia could have like trapped Ukrainians there, that would have been POWs, right? But yeah, they basically made sure like from, you know, the front part, nobody can attack because they're destroying the bridges and things. But it is impossible to verify whether the Ukrainian Kursk offensive has indeed prevented an attack on Sumy. But it is also quite clear that Ukraine's goal of diverting Russia's attention from attacking to defending has failed so far. Russia is still advancing, particularly in Donbass. One of the factors continuing to hinder Ukraine's military capability is the American prohibition on the use of attackums long-range missiles on military targets in Russia. An unnamed Biden administration official was quoted saying that Western long-range missiles would not be effective against Russia because Russia has already moved its military aircraft away from their range. Earlier, it was reported that Britain does not mind Ukraine using its Storm Shadow missiles to hit targets on Russian soil. But the Western media is now claiming that the United States is pressuring London to not allow this. According to the financial... Yeah, but Starmer, who's that? The new prime minister is Starmer, right? Who's like opposite of the, the prime minister who was before a different party. Like there's friction in UK as well. I saw Clarkson was something, something quoting about like how like restrictions on pub and what the fuck that is. So yeah, changing of the parties could also create problems, doesn't it? Because you can change policies. Like, okay, before, like, they were allowing it. Now they might not allow it because the, the, the main guy changed now. Prime Minister changed, the party changed. So changing elections might change the tidy, I guess, turns or whatever. Times, Britain relies on American intelligence to identify storm shadow targets. Thus, Ukraine needs the Americans to be on board with this in order to use storm shadow missiles on Russian targets. So far, the Biden administration has not budged from its position in fear of escalation of the war. What am I, like, <sighs> MI6, what is MI6 doing? Don't they have their own intelligence? Don't they have their own satellites? Why do they need US intel? I don't get that, like, uh, I don't know. But Ukraine is working to ensure absolute independence in this matter from its Western allies. Zelensky announced the development of Ukraine-made Palinitsia long-range missiles slash drones, which is marketed as Kyiv's answer to Russia's Iskander ballistic missiles. The specifications of Palinitsia have not been made public. But sources report about a range of 500 to 700 kilometers and a 50 kilogram warhead. Ukraine has already reportedly used this missile, and if they can achieve its mass production, it would be a massive boost to the AFU's offensive and defensive potential. But even before Palinitsa, and even without permission to use Atakums and Storm Shadow missiles on targets in Russia, Ukraine struck a very important target in Rostov Oblast. On August 18th, a Ukrainian drone hit an oil depot in Politarsk which reportedly served an important role in fuel supplies of the Russian invasion army. This strike caused a massive fire, which the Russian firefighters managed to extinguish only 13 days later. But on August 26th, Russia made a massive round of long-range strikes on Ukraine, the biggest so far in this war. This was done in retaliation for the Kursk offensive. Forbes claims that Russia spent 1.2 to 1.3 billion dollars what? That many target? I didn't know it was that big. Damn. Was ...in this strike, using hundreds of missiles and drones. Infrastructure objects, particularly the energy grid in 15 Ukrainian oblasts, were damaged by this Russian attack. The Ukrainians used F-16 fighter jets in air defense capacity during this attack, but one of the jets was confirmed to be destroyed in unclear circumstances. On August 30th, Zelensky just... Yeah, I saw the sandbox video. Where he said, like, probably didn't use the gun. I guess somebody did. So their plane went down as well. Because how else would F-16s would get destroyed, right? They just launched missiles at the targets, not at the plane. Only their plane would go down is basically something like that. Smith, the commander of the Ukrainian Air Force, which is most likely linked to the loss of an F-16. 
the Kursk offensive has reportedly already had an impact on potential talks between the warring sides. The Washington Post and Le Monde report that in early August, Ukraine and Russia held talks in Doha, Qatar, where they agreed to stop striking each other's energy grid. Russia then reportedly backed off from the agreement after the start of the Kursk offensive and refused to hold another meeting. The Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson Maria Zakharova has already denied this claim. And while Ukraine is fighting a brutal war with Russia, they have to continue dedicating thousands of troops to its border with another neighbor, Belarus. Remember, the offensive in the first days of the war on Kyiv was launched from Belarus. Now Belarus is reportedly concentrating troops, tanks and other military equipment in the Homyalo Blast, including the Wagner Mes- Yeah, I think the Kursk offensive is going to turn into that. Russia is going to attack from Belarus, uh, Wagner or whatever, right? Trying to pressure Kyiv, so they back off from Kursk. That's the thing, right? This, this feels like more like a poker style shit, I don't know, like, you saw one hand, they'll show two hands. Are you ready to show more hands from there on? Like, sure, you can do Kursk offensive, but if Russia goes all out like that, right now you have more things to worry about. What are you going to do from there? You're going to do more ambitious things from there, right? It's just like battle of, like, oh, I'm, I'm more crazy than you. What are you going to do? Like, you're going to amp up the stakes? What are you going to do? That kind of, I don't know where this is going to go. This is just fucked up. Mercenaries ...who relocated to Belarus after Prigozhin's failed coup. Ukraine warned Belarus against any tragic mistakes on August 25th, However, it is doubtful that Belarus's president, Lukashenko, would suddenly decide to attack Ukraine after refusing Putin's persuasions to do this for more than two years. Finally, the second half of August was not rich with news and declarations of foreign military aid to Ukraine. The German media reported about the German government's intention to halve the Ukraine military aid budget to just 4 billion euros in 2025, in the quest to make some budgetary savings. The Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Affairs denied this report, while the German Chancellor Schultz assured Kyiv that they would continue supporting Ukraine. Any cut to the German military aid budget would be a major problem for Ukraine, as Germany remains the second largest donor to the Ukrainian military. And the largest donor, the US, has announced another military assistance package worth $125 million, which includes HIMARS ammunition, artillery shells, javelin and 84 anti-tank guns, among other supplies. Along with that, Denmark has announced a military aid package worth $115 million, the Netherlands pledged 51 drone-detecting radars, while Norway stated that it will fund the production of 155mm shells in Ukraine. All these pledges happen while the Ukrainian government continues complaining about the slowness of promised deliveries. They are currently facing a very threatening situation in Donbass. Some of it has been caused by the lateness of Western deliveries and extreme caution and slowness of Ukraine's Western allies. But some of it is- See, that, that's what I mean. That's why they did the Kursking. Because if you're, if you're like losing in the, uh, you know, like Donetsk and places around that, if you're losing that, and now your own, your own people that's supposed to help you, like, oh, wait a minute, they're losing. Should I help them? Like, isn't that wasted resources? They're going to lose anyway. But if they don't supply you, you're going to lose. You're going to lose, so they're not going to supply you. It's a weird position. So that's why they probably did the Kursk Offensive. So, like, oh, it's easy, we're winning. It's a good PR. You can tell your people there that we're winning, so you can justify giving us our, our aid or something, right? And I won't be surprised if, like, uh, you know, CIA and NSA and, like, this agency has basically supplied this idea to them. Like, do this. Like, we, we, we've been through Cold War. We've done some shit. You have no idea. We planted things that you can't even understand. We know this. We know this psychological warfare. You have to do this, then we can actually persuade people to actually help. So there's many psychological warfare probably going on in the background. It's due to the unwillingness of the Ukrainian government to make unpopular decisions, such as mobilization, in a timely manner. We will see in the near future if Ukraine manages to stop the Russian advance in Donbass. For now, let's look at the visually documented equipment losses suffered by both sides in this war, according to the Oryx blog. As of August 30th, Russia has lost at least 3,345 tanks, 7,661 vehicles, 286 command posts and communication stations, 1,353 artillery systems and vehicles, 410 multiple rocket launchers, 127 aircraft and 144 helicopters. Ukraine has lost at least 907 tanks, 2,868 vehicles, 20 command posts and what? communication stations, 636 artillery systems and vehicles, 78 multiple rocket launches, 99 aircraft and 48 helicopters.
So let me get this straight. Ukraine's numbers are insanely low compared to Russia one, but somehow Russia still looks stronger. That's the feel I got from this video. Russia is still pushing back. Russia is still a, like prospect from like attacking from Belarus and things. Russia is still creating pressure, but Ukraine is still asking for aid. Even though Ukraine is losing much less than Russia, Russia is still showing power like that. Like that's some means. I guess it makes sense. In the end of the day, Russia was this big power with a, basically more tanks than any country on the planet more uh, equipments than uh, basically anybody you can think of like that and ukraine is not going to match to that so even with the all the aids they can receive they're still going to fall short even if they're losing less equipment than russia they're still having problems that is just insane. that the metrics are insane further updates on the war in ukraine are on the way to make sure you don't miss them make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button please consider liking subscribing commenting and sharing it helps immensely Hey, well, there you go. That's this is the first video I've seen who's uh, talking about like Russia's side a bit strongly than any. Obviously, Kings and General is like you know like, everything I've seen so far from them is not biased. So like this is different side they're talking about. I haven't seen videos like this. This is interesting. So yeah, the I think the future. I'm guessing the Belarusian attack is coming, right? Just because cross thing happened, they're gonna plan that. They're gonna do that the worst possible time for Ukraine. So the time you think like there's the worst time to attack Ukraine, they're gonna attack that probably because that's how strategically it works. And Kyiv is like that close to Belarus, that's gonna cause problems, right? I don't know. The first time Russia attacked, like Ukraine was caught off guard. They're not gonna get caught off guard now, but it's still gonna cause problems, right? I don't know. So Kursk offensive might, uh, you know, like give them like more stronger side to Ukraine, yes, especially when it comes to PR. But it might cause Russia and Belarus and everybody to just go too extreme. Right, basically, like I said, like, you know, you, you know, I'm more crazy than you, buddy. Can you go more crazy than me type of way? Just like, who's going to be more, you know, more, uh, you know, stronger and do more ridiculous things type of way. So Russia could just basically attack even more from Belarus and things. Like, try to take over more places, attack from more fronts. That might cause more issues than anything else. I don't know. But we'll see what happens. All right, well, that was Russia is getting closer to Pokrovsk uh, by Kings in general. If you like my next one, subscribe and I'll see you next time.